Okay, we'll try this again. Hopefully no glitches this time. Um, this week we're looking at Corinthians, and we're going to be looking at several different chapters in Corinthians this, this month. Um, we're starting with chapter 3, and uh, they may or may not be in order, um, but we will be going through um, the first part of the book of Corinthians. And today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, being an example for the church. Now, the Corinthian church was not a perfect church. In fact, no church is. You will, ne you will not find a perfect church here on earth. But the great thing about the Corinthian church is we can learn from their mistakes. We can be a better church and we can grow in spirituality and service. And in this letter, the Corinthian letter, Paul was correcting the Corinthian church for some of the things they did wrong, some of the excesses, some of the things that they missed. And they did do a few right things. There was one morning and a little girl was sitting on the bathroom counter and she was watching her father shave. And she watched him shave for, for a few minutes and she asked, she asked him, she said, Daddy, did God make you? And he said, yes, he, he made everybody. And so the little girl sat there and, and uh, thought about it, and then she asked, well, did he make me too? And the father said, yes, of course he did. And so the little girl sat there, and she looked in the mirror for a few minutes, and she said, I think he's doing a lot better job now than he did then. Well, if you want to know the truth, ask a child because they have no filters. Once you ask them, you are going to get their viewpoint. It may be limited as a child's viewpoint is sometimes, but you are going to get the truth from their viewpoint. And, you know, children start off small and they're very dependent on their parents, but they they grow up and they learn independence and they learn how to function on their own and they learn how to, how to do things. And hopefully they grow stronger and wiser and more capable. That's God's plan for children. But interestingly enough, that's God's plan for churches that they grow stronger, that they grow better, they grow wiser. And so Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth, Corinth at the Corinthians. And as you look through chapter after chapter, they were a church with problems. Paul addresses the, the problem of holiness because they were living very worldly lifestyles, but that was the community that they lived in. Instead of being changed, they, they were adopting the lifestyle of the city they lived in. They didn't get along. They had problems of dividing in different groups. And they weren't humble. They wrestled with pride and arrogance. And so Paul is pointing out a problem here in chapter 3 of spiritual immaturity, like a child that, that hasn't fully matured or grown up. 
It's like the, the birthday card that uh, a person received once that said, you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. And immaturity was the Christian's problem in this chapter. It's still a problem in many churches today. And so Paul is focusing on the areas of, of service and spirituality as a way to overcome that. And so first of all, Paul says all Christians need to grow in spirituality. That's what he's talking about in this chapter. In verses 1 and 2, he said this. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready. Leonard Ravenhill, if you ever read any of his books, he's, he's, he talks about revival and, and revival in America and revival in the church. But Leonard Ravenhill tells the story about a group of tourists who are visiting a village. And they ask the old, an old man sitting by the fence. They, they ask him, were any great men born in this village? And the old man replied, nope, only babies. <laughs> this is our reality, both spiritually and physically. We all start off as babies. Growth takes time. And when Paul first planted the church there, it was only natural that these believers would be spiritually immature. Well, all Christians need to learn the foundations of the faith. And sometimes new believers and old believers struggle with going back to their old way of life. Bad habits, bad crowds, bad theology. But as we grow, as we mature, our theology should become stronger. We ought to become more Christ-like. We ought to understand more and more of the Bible. See, Paul puts it, puts it this way later on in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 13. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, a ch put aside childish things. And see, that's what Paul is addressing. He's addressing change. He's addressing growth. We read it a lot at wedding ceremonies, but Paul is taking the whole part of the early chapters of Corinthians and is talking about growing up, becoming mature, becoming changed. You know, one of the most popular species for home aquariums or home saltwater aquariums is the shark. Because people think if you get a shark and you put it in an, an aquarium, it will stay small and it will just grow to the size of the aquarium. But the truth is only some small species, some certain species of sharks will do that, will stay small as defined by the size of the aquarium. The reality is, is you take a shark and put it in an aquarium and it doesn't grow any bigger than the, uh, the aquarium. The reason it doesn't do that is because the shark's growth is stunted. Its water is not correct. 
It doesn't have the ability to grow as it should. Its care is probably not the best. Well, the same thing happens to Christians. Their spiritual growth is stunted because they think, well, if I just do one hour of, of worship in church a week, that's enough. And they never, they never get God outside the four walls of the church. They don't spend a lot of time in prayer or, or in Bible study. They don't experience fellowship and discipleship in, in a small group or other Christians. They don't get involved in service or outreach. And so they never grow up in the Christian life. Now, being spiritually mature doesn't mean being a, a stick in the mud. It, it doesn't mean being boring. If anything, it allows you to experience your freedom in Christ even more. John Calvin wrote this. He said, Christ is milk for infants and strong meat for men. Let's learn from the Corinthians' mistake and graduate from milk to meat. Let's continue to grow spiritually. God has a plan for each one of us. And see, Paul, when he talks about growing, mentions how that plan begins in verses 6 through 8. I planted a seed in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What is important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will, re will be rewarded for their own hard work. See, Paul went and he started this church during one of his missionary journeys. And while he was there, there was two believers named Priscilla and Aquila. And he made a living by working with them in their tent making business. Remember, Paul, while he was a missionary, was also a tent maker. And shortly after Paul left and continued on his missionary journey, a man named Apollos arrived, and with the, lo with the local church members, Priscilla and Aquila, he continued to work in growing the church, the church that Paul started. So that's why Paul writes this, in these verses. And Paul is very quick to point out that God, it's God, not him, it's not Apollos, it's God who gives the church growth. And see, the pattern that Paul puts here is the same pattern that we ought to follow today. See, all of us are called to plant and to water and to wait for God to grow the church. But unfortunately, many churches have just stopped growing. Now, House Church Networks by Larry Kreider lists some shocking statistics. The United States ranks third behind China and India in terms of unchurched people. We are third behind China and India. Of the generation that's born between 1977 and 1994, only 4% are Christian. By comparison, 65% of those born before 1946 are Christian. So we lost a whole generation and more. Churches lose an estimated 2 million, almost 3 million people each year to 
nominalism and secularism. In other words, nominalism, the church is important, and secularism, just the church doesn't even matter or exist. Between 3,500 and 4,000 churches close their doors permanently every year. There are only 1,100 to 1,500 churches started each year. So we're losing more churches than we're starting more churches. The American church loses 72 churches per week or 10 per day. And it only gains 24 per week or three churches per day. So again, that just emphasizes that we're losing more churches than we are starting churches. During the last 10 years, the, the combined membership of all Protestant denominations has declined by 9.5%, which is 4 million, while the national population has increased by 11% which is 24 million. And churches that reach the unchurched are highly intentional, and they understand the culture. The most unchurched generation is generations is here in America. And we need new wineskins to revitalize the church. Jesus talked about wineskins and using new wineskins. And that's what the church needs to do. See, we need to get back to the basics of seeing all the saints doing the work of ministry. Ordinary believers must be given the chance to allow God to do extraordinary things through them. And see, that's one of the things that, that we, we missed, that we stopped doing. God will do extraordinary things through you if you ask him. But we've stopped asking, or we don't believe that God will do extraordinary things. Now, healthy churches are growing churches. And it may not be important who does the planting and who does the watering, but it's important that someone do it. The truth is only 2% of church members invite a, an unchurched person each year. Bottom line is the church is not doing the work of inviting or watering or planting. Now there's other ways to plant and there's other ways to water. But a simple invitation is the easiest and one of the most effective ways. And believe it or not, there will be growth in even the most harshest places. God will make it so. When we were walking the trails Thursday, uh, Friday, and Saturday, the, the places where plants grew was, was amazing. This one, that's nothing but rocks. There is no dirt. There is no soil there. That's, a, that's layers of rocks on the mountainside. And there's this weed or plant looks like weed to me i'm not sure but it's growing i mean it's it's pretty amazing and then you look at this hillside full of rocks and it's a it's a waterfall there is no dirt there that is just rocks on this side on this side and that side and there's all this vegetation all these plants growing there. God will do amazing things if only we plant the seeds and we water them. 
Now, there was a survey taken in Houston to find out what had motivated people to, jo to choose the church where they were members. And 12% chose their church because of prior denominational affiliation. 8% on the basis of architectural beauty of the structure. 3% because of the person in the pulpit. 18% because of the convenience of location, but 58% chose a particular church because of the influence of family or friends. Lifeway Research did a, a study and it said over 90% of new church members said they attended church the first time because a friend had invited them. That's good news, but it can also be discouraging. Because if you're out there planting seeds, and if you're inviting people to church, and you're talking about spiritual things, but you're not seeing any results, don't give up. Remember what verses 6 through 8 says. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the water, and what's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their, hard, their own hard work. That's what God has called us to do, plant the seed, we water it, but who do we trust to grow it? God. And then Paul also talks about another form of growth. He talks about growing spiritual, or growing, it's growing in service as well as spiritually. He writes in verses 9 through 15. For we are God's co-workers, you are God's field, God's building, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down, that foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burnt up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as if through fire. And see, in these verses, Paul compares the, ch the local church to a building. And this building is still under construction. And if you want to destroy a building... If you want a building to not last that you are building, one way is to change the foundation. The second way is to build with inferior materials. Using either one of those or both of them will destroy a building or create a building that will not last. And the foundation that Paul tells us, the foundation of the church, is Jesus Christ. He is the one, the foundation for all who believe. A building is only as solid as its foundation. And any church that doesn't have Christ as the bedrock of their beliefs and ministry is doomed to collapse. Now, understand this, Jesus is not only the foundation for our faith, but he is also the foundation on which the church is built. 
But even if we have the right foundation, that doesn't guarantee a lasting structure. Paul says our works, the things we do, not for salvation, because that only comes through Jesus, but our works, our ministry, our service to the church is the construction materials that build the church on that foundation. So we can either build with those things that burn easily, or we can build with rock and stones, things that will withstand, withstand the storms of life. Flammable, flammable materials like wood and hay and straw will go up in an instant. And the foundation that Jesus has showed us through his ministry of teaching and of helping people is something that we should follow. It's something we should do to build on the same foundation. And Jesus cautioned his disciples in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The problem was the Corinthians wanted to be served rather than serve others. Too many people say, I'm looking for a church that meets my needs and blesses me. I'm, instead of saying, I'm looking for a church to serve and to be a blessing. And see, Paul is saying as we mature in Christ, the focus our focus should increasingly shift to being a servant to others because that is the only way that Jesus said we will become great. The mature follower of Jesus who says or asks, who is going to meet my needs? is going to remain immature all their life. But as we mature and become even more mature, we will ask, whose needs can I meet? See, a church can be like the difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Galilee is a lake that's full of life and fish because it takes in water, but it also gives out water. But nothing lives in the Dead Sea because the water comes in and it has no place to go. And the lake has stagnated. The lake has died. The water flows into the Dead Sea and it stays there. And Paul is saying the same thing will happen to Christians who aren't involved in meaningful service to others. The bottom line is if the church isn't growing, it isn't healthy. And Paul wanted the Corinthian church to grow, to continue to grow in spirituality, spirituality and also service. And Paul's saying that should be the goal of the Corinthians, but that should be our goal as well. Because as we become mature Christians, as we become stronger believers, we will take what God has given us and we will use that to serve 
and to help others. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for, for your word. Help us to be mature Christians. Help us to be strong believers who plant, who water, and leave the results up to you, to trust you to grow where we plant the seed. To trust in you that you will make growth where there is none. So help us to follow the example of Jesus to be servants of all, just as he was. We ask this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>